Uh, we're delighted to have, have you with us. We're delighted to be partnering as the Atlantic Council with Concordia uh, for this, I think, what is going to be a very important uh, discussion here in this setting as well as on the main stage tomorrow. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me my uh, co-facilitator and, and moderator in this ende endeavor, uh, Mauricio Schachte, who is a, a Dutch uh, member of the European Parliament and a good colleague working on a major initiative uh, on Europe with me. We're here to talk about the future of Europe at a pretty critical time, and, and the context, the premise of our conversation is a recognition of the profound historic transformation that this continent has gone through, the remarkable success story that Europe represented from the perspective of coming out of the ravages of World War II to the process of creating a Europe which became one of the most significant drivers for peace and prosperity in the 21st century. And yet we're here talking about the future of Europe because there are some profound questions uh, over the horizon. We want to delve into the future of the European Union because in many respects here we are actually watching. Many of you, we hope, are shaping history as we, in, as we speak. And the implications for what Europe becomes and where Europe is headed are profound. They have an impact today on the issues we care about. It's obvious to all of you working these issues that Europe is facing certain historic challenges, whether from the east, from the south, the internal forces in Europe itself that are, have been coined in some respects forces of fragmentation that are trying to pull at the seams of, of Europe, and among some calling into question its unity, its direction, its future. We're here in the wake of the British Brexit vote, of very difficult terrorist attacks that have shaken the continent, a migration crisis, a sluggish economy, the challenges of sustained youth unemployment, in many respects, the future of Europe is in play. This matters profoundly for all of us who are here. If you just look at the issues that are on the agenda of the United Nations General Assembly this week, you can't find an issue where Europe's voice isn't critical to helping to forge a solution on that agenda. We believe, I think many of us working on this and many of Europe's American friends, that Europe has been a profound force for good in the world. And as an American, as a critical partner, our partner of first resort on so many global challenges, today as we gather here in New York at the United Nations, one of the core institutions of a rules-based world order, we have to recognize that there are forces that are challenging this essentially rules-based world order that the United States and Europe together help forge in the wake of World War II. And the question is whether we're going to watch that process or help shape it. So to, to get into this conversation, uh, Mauricio will help me moderate through the course of today, a Dutch member of the European Parliament, uh, part of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats, and a colleague on this. We're going to turn first to have a scene setter uh, from, in some respects, our colleague who is with us is Mr. Europe Today, His Excellency Franz Timmermans, the first Vice President of the European Union Commission, uh, former Dutch Foreign Minister and a Minister for European Affairs, and our very not just articulate voice, but critical actor on the issues of our agenda. We'll turn next to set a baseline. Part of the challenge that we're discussing is a disconnect sometimes between what is perceived as a project of the elites and where our publics are. And so we're gonna to turn to Richard Wyke, who has joined us from uh, the Pew Research Center, who has completed a pretty comprehensive survey of European attitudes as the Director of Global Attitudes Research at Pew to help set a baseline for our conversation about what are European public's perceptions of some of these core issues. We'll turn to Dr. Lena Poyakova, who is a deputy director at the Atlantic Council and a researcher on populist and nationalist trends in Europe to help us understand the drivers of this set of attitudes that are challenging uh, both sides of the Atlantic at this time. And then Mar Marita will launch our conversation about what we do with this. What is our response? How do we begin to offer solutions and take a strategy forward? How do we think about holding Europe together by galvanizing the center, galvanizing the core? Our rules today are very simple. Uh, we're at the Concordia Summit, and while this is meant to be an interactive conversation among those of you who play critical roles in shaping the future of, of Europe and transatlantic relations, uh, we will be live streaming this uh, conversation, which means that our discussion is essentially on the record. Um, 
this is meant to be a, an interactive session, so we hope to have participation from everyone around this table throughout the course of the next uh, two hours. And we're really driving here not just towards a conversation, an analysis of the problems, but with an understanding of that, what do we do about that as we begin to forge as a common goal, what, is, what are some of the solutions, what is a strategy uh, uh, for the way forward, and ensuring a strong, coherent Europe as a partner of the United States on so many global challenges. I'd also encourage all of you who are participating in this conversation to, to broaden that conversation through our social media presence using the hashtag Concordia16. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Franz Timmermans to kick off our, our conversation. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Thank you very much for, thank you very much for having me. I'm really honored. and. It's, it's great to see so many friends around the table and colleagues and people uh, I have worked with uh, for so many years. Uh, and um, Yossi Gal just came up to me and he was ambassador to my country and uh, we've been friends since. And uh, I asked him, how is Shimon Perez doing? Because, you know, I really feel for uh, the president and his present state. And I also immediately was reminded of, of, of something Shimon told me when I saw him uh, uh, recently, he said about modern politics and about the problems we have in modern politics. He said, when I was younger, a bit younger, he said, I was responsible for the male in Israel. And um, I learned of a young man who fell in love with a girl on the other side of Israel. And he started writing her very passionate letters to declare his love. Every day, every day, another letter. And after about six months, the girl ended up marrying the mailman. Um, uh, there's so much truth in this story about today's politics. It's not just about um, uh, content, it's also about the way the message is formulated and the messenger. I want to start there because, you know, beauty, as they say, is in the eye of the beholder, and the beholders in Europe today don't see Europe's beauty. Whereas one could also take a completely different approach to the issue of Europe in crisis. Look at what's happened. We are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution that is happening with a speed unprecedented in human history. We're at the tail end of one of the worst economic and financial crises the world has ever known. We're in the middle of um, uh, insecurity, the arc of insecurity which borders Europe all the way from Western Africa to the Himalayas. If you take all these challenges into account, Europe's not doing so bad. Europe's not doing so bad. If you look at what's happening in terms of the structure of our societies, you know, I was trained as a soldier to fight against fellow Europeans. That's not that long ago. And now we are part of one organization. So that would be my first remark. Don't count us out too easily. We're in better shape than we think ourselves. Secondly, the fact that Europeans moan a lot, especially political leaders in nation states, about Europe, combined with the fact that they t tend to meet almost every week, if not every a couple of times every month, is in fact an acknowledgement that although they are unhappy with things, they know that they are in the same boat and they better start fixing the leaks in that boat and they need to do so collectively. So secondly, with all the tensions we have in Europe, there is deep-rooted understanding that we need each other in Europe to come out of uh, the crises uh, we're in today. My third point is this. Dear American friends, you can pivot to Asia all you want. We will draw you back to Europe with what we're doing. And not just because of what's happening in Europe, which might affect your strategic interests, but also because the deep societal tensions and challenges we have in Europe are I would say, identical to the ones you see in American society. The core of which is the middle classes for the first time since the Second World War wonder whether their children will be as well off as they are today. And they assume, not without cause, that their children will be challenged more than they have been. And that the assumption of you know, the elevator taking up uh, the middle classes to higher grounds is no longer necessarily true, and the elevator might be heading in a different direction. This creates grounds for politics based on fear, and politics based on fear, combined with anger, have this interesting 
effect of people looking for confirmation of their fear. It's biological. And not wanting to see evidence that dispels the fear. And here is perhaps the main point I would like to make in, pre in the presence of the Atlantic Council and Pew in particular. I have been using data by, um, collected by Pew probably for about 20 years now in my political life. You know, I wish we had more people in Europe doing the same sort of thing um, on trends in our societies. But today, fact-free politics rules. Today, a lie confirming your fears is believed much more than the truth that dispels your fear. And this is something politicians should start thinking about. Look at what happened with the Brexit campaign. I hope in the, that discussion, you know, somebody might remind Boris Johnson and others every week, so where's this 350 million pounds you've promised for the NHS? And let, let's not, you know, allow people to first lie, create a certain atmosphere, and then after they got what they wanted, to get away with the lies. And say, okay, it's campaign, these things happen. I think this is something we need to be, become more serious about. Why? Because what we see in European societies is fear and anger galvanizing into something we are not unfamiliar with in our history, which is scapegoating. And of course, some traditional scapegoats are scapegoats again, beginning with the Jews. But we have new scapegoats, the foreigners, the migrants, uh, Muslims, minorities, Roma. And this is poison in any society. And I dare say that even in this great nation, with its huge tradition of integration and immigration, that poison is not entirely absent in the political debate either today. So we have a common challenge. So if you know, I could, I could talk to you for, I, I will stop in a minute, but I can talk to you for hours on all the specific issues, the economic reform, the need for um, uh, change in the European construction, yes or no, the need for all the, but that's not what I wanted to do today. I wanted to talk about the fundamental values we risk forgetting and we should be advocating. Why is it that those who have different values are so vocal, so loud, so present, and why are we so completely absent in not just defending what we believe in, but also in trying to convince our citizens, which I believe is the truth, that the future is there for us to grasp, to mold. This fourth industrial revolution could put Europe in the lead in terms of a sustainable economy, sustainable energy, circular economy. We are better placed than any other continent to grasp these opportunities. We only need to see it. So for heaven's sake, let's get some new mailmen in bringing the message to our citizens. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Vice President, that was a perfect start to the conversation. Um, an important reminder that at the basis of what makes Europe and our transatlantic relationship special is as grounded in the democracies that we are is grounded in the values that have underpinned that cooperation. And you hit exactly at what we want to take up today. Um, in many respects, those of us who are invested in the values that underpin this experiment are on defense. Well, how do we actually change that to galvanize our colleagues, to galvanize our publics, to defend what's so precious to our, in our societies? We want to first begin to understand some of those trends that the, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans uh, uh, spoke about and then begin to look into that question. So I want to turn next to, to Richard, please, uh, who we have started a new rule at the Atlantic Council to begin our conversations to base them in an understanding of where our publics are right now, to take head on this idea of, uh, of these conversations being detached from where public opinion is. So Richard, uh, please enlighten us uh, on the basis of your latest surveys. Great. Well, thank you very much, Damon. And uh, Mr. Vice President, it's wonderful to hear that you've been using our data in, in your work. So. Uh, happy to hear that, happy to be here today to have a chance to talk a little bit about some of the survey work that we do at the Pew Research Center. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last few years in Europe, and what I thought I'd do today is really highlight four themes or, in some ways, four discontents that we see in our European data. And I think all or, or most of you probably have this handout here. Uh, what I tried to do there was go through and pull out four charts that sort of illustrate uh, these different themes or these di different discontents that we see in European public opinion. Um, so if you look at the first chart, for example, it, it actually taps into uh, exactly the issue you were just talking about, the, the lack of optimism for the next generation. So this is a question we asked all around the world in a, a survey we conducted last year in 40 different countries. Uh, when children in our country grow up, do you think they'll be better off or worse off financially than their parents? And what we found is that in Latin America, uh, in Africa, in Asia, there's a lot of optimism about the next generation. They think children are going to be better off. In the Middle East, in the United States, and especially in Europe, uh, there's a lot of pessimism. People don't think the next generation is going to be better off. And as you might expect, uh, this is a question that's very strongly correlated with recent economic performance. So in countries where you've seen um, strong GDP growth over the last decade, you've got more optimism for the future. Where there's been lower growth, you have much less optimism. And I think it's an important question because it taps into the fact that people aren't only um, dissatisfied with their current economic conditions, they're very concerned about the long-term economic future and the prospects for their children. The second uh, area I wanted to highlight is security and concerns about terrorism. We know from other questions we ask that uh, in just about all the European countries that we survey, ISIS is considered the top threat. And what this next chart highlights is the fact that um, there's an intersection in the minds of many between the terrorism issue and the refugee issue. Um, in eight of the ten countries we surveyed this year, people think that the influx of refugees is going to lead to more terrorism in their country. So again, you know, there's a lot of concern about this issue, and the refugee um, problem has tied into that and has heightened people's fears around the topic of terrorism. Um, and then a third issue really has to do with um, cultural anxieties that people have, um, concerns and unease that some have about the growing diversity in many European societies. So as an example of that, um, here's a question that we've asked a few times over the years. Do you think most Muslims in our country want to adopt our country's customs and its way of life, or do you think they want to remain distinct from the larger society? And when we ask that question, what we see is that uh, majorities or pluralities in all countries say they believe Muslims in their country want to be distinct. And I think this highlights the fact that among many, uh, they see groups in society which they believe don't want to participate in the broader culture, and they have a, a sort of cultural threat perception as a result of this. And then a, a fourth and, and final theme uh, has to do with concerns or skepticism about the, the broad European project. And we've asked many questions in recent years that illustrate this in different ways. Uh, this is a question that we asked in a survey earlier this year. Essentially, do you want more power to be um, given to Brussels? Do you want power returned to national governments? Or do you think things should remain the way they are? Uh, there's very little support for giving more power to Brussels. Um, and in, in all countries, either a majority or a plurality say they want more power returned to the national governments. And um, this is pre-Brexit. Maybe some things have changed since then. But it fits into a broader pattern of what we've seen in recent years, which is growing skepticism in different ways about the European project. So you have uh, economic discontent. You have concerns about terrorism, you have cultural anxieties, and you have skepticism about the European project. And in different ways, I think all of these uh, trends 
are driving support for populism, for anti-establishment parties, and in some ways, um, you see similar types of patterns occurring in the United States in driving the, the greater support for populism here as well. So I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to talk more about this data or other things that we've done in terms of our research in Europe over the last few years. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for Pew's work to keep us grounded in these conversations and what's happening in, in public opinion. Uh, Richard is focused on the what. Uh, what do our populations, you know, what kind of feedback are they giving on these key issues? Uh, Alina Poyakova is going to help us with the why. What are the drivers? She's part of a, uh, leading some research at the Atlanta Council on some of the drivers of, of trends in, in Europe uh, on populism. But she also represents part of our strategy in getting this right, what I call our intergenerational strategy. We have around this table former presidents and prime ministers with extraordinary leadership and experience. We have those who are active and remain active in their parliaments and, and uh, uh, public debates uh, politically today. And we also have uh, what I like to say are, are future drivers and leaders of this. And Alina, along with her colleague David Karani, represents that commitment for us as we work through this effort to have an intergenerational strategy uh, that leverages all of that. So please, Alina, what's driving some of these views? So thank you, Damon, and thank you, Mr. Vice President, for those opening uh, remarks. Um, and this is a, a great segue from uh, what Richard was just uh, briefing us on about some of the uh, polling and the attitudes that Pew has been doing. Um, so what we've seen in Europe, particularly since the financial crisis, is a real turn to what you can say are alternative political parties, uh, particularly on the far right, but also on the far left. And in many ways, this rise in populism and this broader turn to the right that we're seeing across the EU is a uh, backlash to the success of the EU. So the European Economic and Political Project has been incredibly successful, as some of the other speakers have already said. But the cultural project, the idea of having a supranational or transnational European identity has not really taken root. And what we see in Europe today is that the national identity remains incredibly salient, incredibly prominent for most Europeans, and the idea of Europeanness has not really sunk in on the majority of the population. So what is driving this trend uh, towards far-right populism specifically across the EU? Um, I'm gonna say a few things about what we do know and then uh, some things that we don't know and should think about going forward. So what do we know? Uh, we know that those who vote for far-right parties across the EU have a similar profile. Uh, they're individuals who in some ways have been left out of this broader EU project. Uh, they tend to be uh, lower educated. Uh, there are more men who vote for the far right. Uh, and they tend to have much stronger anti-immigrant, Eurosceptic, and authoritarian attitudes. On the other hand, uh, this continued the continued salience of nationalism and people's own sense of belonging to their nation state versus Europe more broadly is also contributing to the rise of parties that seek for stronger national sovereignty in their own policies. And it's really this combination of Euroscepticism, anti-immigrant views, and continued strength of identities uh, that's pushing forward this turn to the right. But it's also important to keep in mind that far-right parties themselves have been addressing what are legitimate anxieties and grievances of the European population. So we also know that contextual factors, so economic decline, uh, the rise in immigration, these kinds of broad processes that we often think of as fueling the rise for anti-immigrant, anti-establishment parties are necessary but not sufficient conditions in each country to actually have a successful far-right party. Uh, one example um, that I like to talk about is Austria. Um, Austria is a country that has perhaps one of the strongest far-right parties, the Austrian Freedom Party now, uh, that in many ways exemplifies some of the Western European far-right parties, uh, like the National Front as well. And Austria has done incredibly well and fared very well through the economic crisis, the recession, unemployment rate has been very low. Uh, Austria's economy has been very stable and very prosperous, yet, they have one of the strongest far-right parties. 
Um, so we have to keep in mind that we can't jump to conclusions about uh, how economic factors, economic decline, rise in immigration actually affect or influence the rise of the far right. So there are some things that we don't know. Uh, what we don't know is where are Europe's young going to go? So some of the research that Pew has also done and other polling tells us that young people still tend to be much more pro-European than older generations. This is a good thing. The bad thing is that more recently, in some of the more recent elections, we've seen young people turn to populism in higher numbers than they have before. Uh, this has happened primarily in the recent elections in Slovakia, um, also uh, the recent local elections in Germany, uh, where the far right uh, alternative for Germany did much better than anybody had expected, and did much better than uh, the Chancellor's Party, the CDU. Um, so. Europe's youth are divided. There are some good trends there that we're seeing uh, for European unity, but there are also some potentially negative ones that we don't know much about quite yet. Um, and as the youth of Europe continue to face stagnant opportunities, particularly in places like Greece, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, that were most affected by the crisis and haven't really recovered from that crisis, uh, we, we are in a a tipping point uh, when it comes to uh, really embedding European values in the younger generation, those who grew up in modern Europe, and as a result, maybe take some of those benefits uh, for granted. And I'll only close to say that while we have some good news and bad news, um, particularly when it comes to Europe's youth, uh, what we don't know is what will happen if one of these far-right parties actually becomes a governing party. Uh, many of their policies are economic uh, isolationists, um, economic protectionism. They're not right in that economic sense. They don't advocate for free markets or liberalism. And, and honestly, in a incredibly integrated EU, an in incredibly integrated Europe, both economically and politically, uh, economic protectionist policies will likely lead to a complete disaster. Uh, so we don't know if one of these parties came to power would actually be able to push through some of the things that they promised to do. Uh, and I think with that, I, I will end. Uh, so thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Alina, for that analysis. Now I want to get to what the purpose of this session is. What do we do about this? Um, what is the response? How do you hold Europe together by galvanizing uh, the core, galvanizing American friends that stand with Europe? Uh, to kick off this part of the discussion, I want to turn to somebody who's out, actually out there having to generate votes, uh, a member of the European Parliament, Marietje Schachte, please. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the Atlantic Council and to all of you to participate in this uh, very timely discussion that I think is really on our minds and weighing on our shoulders every day uh, in Europe these days. And um, as I was listening to the excellent uh, kickoffs of this discussion, I was reminded of a research that one of the most uh, significant Dutch newspapers did uh, looking at attitudes over a longer period of time in the Netherlands. And uh, the answer that uh, came, came up most by people is that many people feel that I am fine, they are fine, but we are not. So uh, I think what we see is, although on an absolute level the quality of life in Europe is extraordinarily high, uh, it means that people have uh, a lot to lose. Questions about identity are back on the agenda uh, with, uh, with a full force, and uh, people are worried not only about their own quality of life, we see in the Pew Research, but particularly that of their children, and that is for the first time since World War II that there's not an automatic anticipation of improvement. And of course, there are good reasons for uncertainty. There's rapid change all around people, globalization, technological revolutions, challenges uh, to the environment, migration, and new security threats and terror coming very close to home. And um, uh, amidst the fear and uncertainty, uh, people are looking for scapegoats and also recognize that there's certainly eroded trust uh, and eroded legitimacy of the political leadership that they see. And the vacuum, I think, has been tapped into with quite a lot of success by populist, nationalist, protectionist forces who are voicing in an emotional manner. Uh, anger, are very clear about what they are against, 
and they are energized and I think they, they can sense that victory may be there for them fast. And we, let me uh, be clear about that here, the establishment, uh, people who are in elected office, yes, we are the elites, uh, are uh, more associated with the status quo, which is challenged. Uh, and I find this uh, difficult myself because the status quo is not something I want to defend. I think we need a much better Europe that delivers more for people. A lot has to be improved. And our story is not always as exciting because it is more rational. Uh, it is more backed up by research uh, facts and figures. Uh, and having responsibility uh, in most European democracies today requires compromise, requires working in coalitions, and so it requires that you do not always get 100% of your ideals. And so I think uh, the question of uh, what would happen if these uh, new uh, forces, populist parties, would, would get elected or get uh, strong results uh, is a question that's already partially been answered. Uh, in the Netherlands, when uh, they were about to take responsibility, uh, the Populist Party walked away. Uh, recently, after the Brexit vote, I think it's very clear what happened. Nobody wanted to own the success of their own campaign. Why? Because responsibility in this context would be a kiss of death. Because it is hard to uh, kick against the establishment if you co-own um, the, the results of it. Um, and so I think um, not only uh, we need politicians to speak out more clearly, uh, but we also need different stakeholders to participate. And I, I find that for the private sector and for some civil society organizations, this is a daunting uh, perspective. It is difficult to get in the arena and to face uh, the criticism, uh, but still it is necessary because I think there's a real risk in Europe of paralysis uh, while there is a silent majority that can rise and should rise, and I think the middle needs to uh, step up to the plate, and this has to be a, a multi-stakeholder initiative. So uh, a few thoughts on, on what should, should be done, and this is of course multi-layered and uh, takes time, but I do think politicians need to be responsive in new ways to concerns. Uh, not only do we hear people calling for more transparency and access to information about decision making, but first and foremost, people want to feel that they have been heard and that they can be heard. And I think the institutions uh, and uh, governments are not at all using the innovative ways that are available through new technologies uh, to try to at least provide avenues for people to participate as much uh, as they can. Uh, and secondly, in the current context in the EU, I think we need short-term deliverables uh, so that people can, can be uh, rebuilding, so that trust among people can be <coughs> rebuilt through results. Um, there are serious challenges uh, with regard to migration, with regard to security, and with regard to jobs, particularly to young people, that are really waiting for a clear answer on the European level, uh, and uh, we cannot fail those people. So through results, I think uh, we, should, we should deliver. And it cannot just be uh, one crisis uh, summit uh, after the other. Uh, we cannot stay at a point where people actually think that the only way Europe can move forward is through crisis. I think that that would really be uh, an unacceptable kind of perspective to sketch, especially for a young generation. But let's also build on what works and where Europe can set the norms. When it comes to environmental protection, data privacy, antitrust and competition, uh, it, is, it is interesting how while some people doubt Europe, they see confidence and uh, uh, strong actions by the European Commission uh, in recent cases such as uh, tax ruling on Apple or um, other uh, big companies. Then uh, I think on the longer term there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and there's a need for uh, a drawing out of a sketch of a perspective of what's going to happen in the long <laughs> term. Uh, I think most people have, after the Brexit referendum, more questions than answers about what is going to happen next. And even if European leaders may not know what they can and cannot do, I think they should sketch the fact that they're going to work over it over a certain period of time and that institutional questions are going to be uh, addressed as well. And I would urge a more global perspective that should inform uh, Europe in terms of uh, what we should do now and why, and not only focus on the nationally defined interest as if it would be in contrast uh, with the European interest, which too often um, happens. So 
on the one hand, we see big loss of trust. Uh, on the other hand, we see strong nostalgia to a past that is indeed the rules-based system, the open society, where fair competition and fundamental rights are, uh, are unquestionable uh, norms. And on the other hand, I think we see sometimes too much hope and a blind trust by people in newcomers on the political stage, where they're willing to just uh, believe every uh, promise um, of populists, nationalists, and protectionists. So um, in closing, I think we also need a perspective change ourselves. Uh, we often hear that the new parties, the new movements that are emerging are uh, on the far left and on the far right. We almost take this analysis for granted. But as was written recently in The Economist, and I think many people have observed, we should perhaps look more in defining what is happening in terms of those who seek uh, an open society and those who seek a more closed society, a more open economy and a more uh, closed economy. And if we look at it that way, it would also inform the middle of the political spectrum, those who believe in compromise, consensus, and cooperation uh, from the center, not to be persuaded to compete on the left or on the right, which we so often see happening, and which, by the way, I can see in the European Parliament, leads to very strange bedfellows, very strange coalitions uh, in voting behavior. Um, but instead, if just as the populists, nationalists, protectionists are doing in working together, forming a block against the establishment, uh, a block against uh, what, we, uh, what we cherish, I think, in, in our um, uh, European societies. What if the middle would also gravitate towards each other instead of towards the margins? And if they would work together more? I think that is actually what is needed. And it will, of course, uh, require a different kind of approach in campaigning, more collaboration, more coalitions, more multi-stakeholder approach, approach. And it would certainly need a, a little bit of guts uh, and a little bit of uh, risk-taking by political leaders uh, to do this. But I think it is very much necessary, and I hope that um, the Atlantic Council and uh, this discussion today that uh, I'm really looking forward to can contribute to uh, more action and more uh, results towards the answer of what we need to do now in Europe instead of just uh, being concerned about uh, the challenges. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mariche. Please, uh, we're going to begin a conversation. Catch my eye. I'll bring our colleagues into the conversation. We've had Mariche put on the table uh, a set of ideas, a set of uh, proposals, in some respects galvanizing uh, the center, galvanizing the core, uh, yet when we're at a time when we see traditional establishment parties, many of which you have been actively involved in under pressure. And so what is the vision, the strategy, uh, the policies that will help galvanize and attract support? Um, we've got an incredible wealth of expertise and experience sitting around this table. Uh, many of you have been involved in building the Europe uh, that we see today, and for that we're grateful for those contributions. Um, many of you have been involved in reinforcing the transatlantic relationship and its support uh, for Europe as well, former presidents, uh, prime ministers, foreign ministers, heads of international organizations, ambassadors. We have with us some former U.S. ambassadors who've served in European nations, U.S. members of Congress private sector leaders and strategists here, uh, as well as prominent voices from countries that are European and aspire to be part of the European Union as well, a very important facet to this conversation that some of the greatest supporters of Europe, uh, of the European Union today, are sometimes not even in the European Union. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up for brief comments uh, from my colleagues, uh, from all of you and uh, give you an opportunity to offer exchanges uh, upon uh, each other. Um, let me ask uh, uh, President uh, Amato. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. It's, it, it's really a pleasure, as uh, Franz said, to meet so many old friends and colleagues in, in working for Europe. Very shortly, I have three points. First point, Brexit. Uh, we haven't touched upon it uh, enough today. Uh, I'm one of those who think and want to think that the game is not over. If the British electorate did make a mistake, there is no reason to consider this mistake irreversible. Uh, there are already uh, several friends of Europe in the UK 
who think that should the final conditions of the negotiation with uh, the Commission and, and, and with the Union not be satisfactory, why shouldn't the British elector have a vote on these final conditions? And this is my advice uh, to the negotiators on the side of the European Union. Please be tough. Don't give the UK government the sense that what they want can be easily achieved, even staying out. Brexit is Brexit, Mother Teresa said. Uh, uh, said uh, 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 sorry. Uh, 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 and therefore, if it's going to be Brexit, you won't have what you have now. And if you want to preserve what you have now or part of it, going out is not the right direction. So there could be a second vote in the UK tomorrow, and you never know what the consequences would be. My second point has to be more generally with Europe as it is, discontent, expectation. Uh, first, we need two things. First of all, reshaping powers means giving Europe some more powers where these powers are absolutely essential for its missions to be uh, 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 performed. Uh, the Eurozone uh, needs more Europe. Immigration needs more Europe, but also not expecting every single member state to be ready to accept immigrants the same way as all the others. More Europe has to be coupled with a coalition of the willings in this case. And there is also a case for less Europe in several areas. And sooner or later, we have to decide we didn't do it uh, uh, at the time of the Constitutional Treaty uh, when it was part of our mandate. It's time to do it. If Europe has a general responsibility on the environment, this does not mean that how to dispose of your garbage has to be regulated by a European directive. This is a little bit, it's an overstretching of power that is absolutely not needed. So there is a balance that has to, uh, uh, to, to be found. And of course, when something is expected from Europe, delivery, my God, is essential. Because the only way to convince people that Europe is useful is not to discuss about the usefulness of Europe, but uh, 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 showing the uh, output of an activity, of a decision-making process, of something that is being done. Immigration is the perfect area in which this could happen. And my third point is certainly uh, to my colleagues that have remained in politics. They have to get rid of what the economist rightly named as the post-truth society. And they have to fight against it. They have to find the courage of the truth, not being scared by the impact of the non-truths that are being said, which are an essential part of the uh, uh, positions against. This is something that really requires some courage and it's needed. And finally, we have here some friends coming from countries that 20 year, years ago we had said, you will be part of Europe. They are still there waiting. And they have done what was needed to become part of Europe. They have been subject to the transformative power of the European Europe, still waiting there. Europe not only cannot be dismantled, 
but has to be accomplished entirely because it's not completed as yet. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's expressly why, as we talk about the future of Europe, many of you are from the European Union, but we intentionally wanted your American friends and those nations that want to be part of Europe as part of this conversation on the future. As we go forward, I'm going to turn to Paula Dobryansky next. I want to give Mr. Vice President, whenever you want to come in with a two-finger, you can interrupt me. I'm asking Mauricio to help me so that we can pull this together into a coherent summing up uh, in terms of a way forward. I also want to pick up on the President's points, who, who made a pretty interesting point on uh, the durability of Brexit. And uh, in the course of our discussion, put people like Guy de Cédier and Mark Leonard, our Brit who's here in the room, uh, on, on the spot to think a little bit and respond to that. But let me turn first uh, to Paula Dobriansky, uh, a proud member of the Atlanta Council Board, also uh, leading here in Concord former Under Secretary of State, Paula. Thank you very much, and congratulations to both Concordia and also the Atlantic Council for this forum. And also, the remarks made this morning uh, by the lead-offs were absolutely excellent. I wanted to first say uh, to Vice President Timmermans, definitely we don't count Europe out. I would say absolutely not. Uh, but there is concern about a complacency and also drift, what I would identify as drift in an unusual way on the continent of Europe and in the context of the transatlantic relationship. And I think that needs to be harnessed. So that's my first point. I also agree we definitely need new mailmen <laughs> in this process. Um, mailmen who are not on the defensive, but we go on the offensive. We should have a stake in our values and defending and advocating for our values. That is what we are all about, and that needs to be regenerated in this case and have strong advocates. And thirdly, we need a new moral narrative, not on the values that we hold so dearly, but I think what has been missing is a strong advocacy on the part of our leadership and thinking through what are the ways through coalitions through the NGO community, through the private sector, of ways of advancing what constitutes the liberal international order as we know it. It is what has preserved peace, security, and stability, not only in Europe, but globally. It's been challenged. It's been challenged not only on the continent of Europe by the Russians, but it's also been challenged in Asia, for example, the Chinese, others. We should be not on the defensive. We should be on the offense. Three quick recommendations. One, I think it's absolutely essential for the forum uh, that uh, Concordia and the Atlantic Council are holding next year. Let's hold, have the voice of a new generation represented. And forgive me, I think I'm in that older group, but I look at Alina here. You know, she represents that uh, new generation. We should have the young leaders. They should be at that, the table and in that discussion. So that's a first recommendation. Second, I definitely would like to see the discussion about the new international order, and I shouldn't say new, but the liberal international order, and in particular, what must remain constant that we advocate and hold, but what needs to be modified? Because we're facing a new global environment. You can't stay stagnant, and we're seeing that there are pressures. There has to be some modification of institutional structures. Finally, it's my own personal pitch, but I do think energy matters on the continent of Europe. I think that energy is one of the most critical issues. Every single country is grappling with what should be the right energy mix, and it also impacts their economies. That is definitely a component that undergirds this. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Paula, for those specific ideas. Let me turn next to Sally Painter, uh, CEO of Blue Star Strategies, a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council and a champion for Europe and NATO in Washington. Sally. Well, thank you, Damon, uh, and thank you very much, Concordia and the Atlantic Council. I, I very much enjoyed uh, the comments that I've heard, and I'm, it's great to see so many people here listening. Um, I'd like to make two observations and then two suggestions. How did we get here? Um, after the financial crisis of 2008 and our anemic recovery, the leadership uh, put policies in place to address the crisis that did not result in any shared prosperity. People who were rich and did well before the crisis, they're back and they're doing well again, and the 1% is succeeding when 99% are not. The rest are trying to figure out how to get the leadership to look at them and to put policies in place that affects them in their daily lives. 
We had opportunistic leaders who took advantage of the fear and insecurity throughout the crisis, and they created a campaign against what I call the other. What's the other? The other are migrants, banks, Muslims, people that aren't like us, and they demonized them, and they simplified the problem. And it's happening as much in our country here as it's happening in Europe. So we're really missing the leadership we need to embrace everybody, because I think everybody is other. So how do we address it? How do we embark on uh, supporting leaders who talk about positive things, who, who talk about bringing us together, who, who develop policies that will address this lack of shared prosperity and get rid of the blame game? We need policies that demonstrate that people, that our leaders understand what they're going through and that they're going to do something about it. And I hearken back to what others have said. Alina and David Karani here are the next generation. When I was coming up um, as a young professional, the transatlantic relationship and transatlantic activities, NATO, EU, OECD, was where you went as a professional. If you look in the, in the United States today and you go on Capitol Hill or you even go in, in, um, in the think tanks, they're working on Asia. They're working on the Middle East. They are not working on the transatlantic agenda. So we really do need to focus on that next generation um, and working on getting rid of who the other is, because I think the other is us. Terrific. Thank you very much. I want to bring in, I've got uh, Natalia Gehrman. Guy, did you want to come in on the, the Brexit point now or in just a, a minute? Okay. All right. Then let me turn to Natalia Gehrman uh, next on my list, uh, former Prime Minister, Foreign Minister of Moldova. Good to have you with us, Natalia. And uh, congratulations to the Atlantic Council and uh, Concordia for the organization of this very timely discussion. And let me bring you the perspective of the neighborhood of the European Union. So uh, Republic of Moldova, the eastern neighbor of the European Union. And I think that uh, taking into account uh, the, the way the current state of affairs of the European Union is affecting the perception of the EU uh, with its neighbors is a very legitimate part of the current discussions. So how does it affect us after Brexit, after the economic and financial crisis, and uh, once we are also part of the um, general effort on managing the refugee crisis in um, Europe? And uh, for us, uh, well, some of the colleagues referred to 20, 25 years ago. The European Union does represent this uh, beacon of uh, democracy, rule of law, prosperity, and stability as a model for the reforms that we are implementing in our countries, but also as a very important direction, or should I say the horizon, the horizon uh, that is... Um, driving the generations of us in uh, Eastern Europe to become the members, the full-fledged members of the European Union and contribute to stability, prosperity, and democracy. I think we have to also put a legitimate questions uh, nowadays whether the alternative models uh, rather than the European Union are gaining ground and even part of the legitimacy and uh, should I uh, mention, for example, the Gulf states for, uh, for that matter. And uh, I also think we should put a question whether the integration and uh, joining of the, uh, to the European Union continues to be still attractive for smaller neighbors, both uh, in the south and in the east, uh, knowing, of course, and observing very closely the decision-making process in the uh, European Union and how the political and sometimes economic choices of less powerful, less uh, big members of the EU are influenced by the bigger ones. Uh, there is also a legitimate question to examine on how the European Union relates on a daily basis to its neighbors. Uh, we in um, Eastern Neighborhood, of course, most of us have the um, uh, fantastic instrument called Association Agreement deep and comprehensive free trade area. And uh, my country, of course, has uh, uh, managed to negotiate the visa-free travel for its citizens to the European Union. These are uh, extraordinary integration uh, instruments. 
And uh, if we are talking about the usefulness of the European Union, as President Tomato just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I think these are some of the very best examples of uh, the uh, attractive power of the European Union, but also some very concrete policies that are helping the reform process, the change of the mentality and the integration effort uh, of some of us into the EU. But there are also alternative examples too. And this is where uh, the European Union sometimes prefer to look somewhere else and lose interest very often when uh, there is a deviating pattern in some of the uh, neighboring countries from uh, the rule of law or democracy. And I think uh, you should stay very firm on that particular standard um, as well. So uh, I would also say that we are uh, watching uh, with greatest interest uh, the specific crisis and clashes of uh, interest. And unfortunately, we very often become such a playground of clashes of interest between East and West. Take my own country, where the Transnistrian conflict is still not yet uh, solved, and we are continuing peaceful efforts uh, to solve it. South Ossetia, Ukraine. And so uh, I think all of them have to be taken uh, by uh, its own merit on a case-by-case -case basis, and we should never allow uh, those particular instances to escalate to an overall confrontation. And so uh, as just as uh, uh, carefully we are watching the so-called third-party scenarios, so again Ukraine and Syria, and I, uh, I think we cannot allow it to become the um, very deep playground of East and West uh, uh, confrontation. And I think uh, the way out uh, of um, that very complicated and uh, worrying uh, uh, situation is, of course, more Europe uh, and not less. Uh, in, um, in our perception, uh, we would like, of course, to see the European uh, Union cope gracefully, but also justly with the current crises. And I mentioned Brexit, financial crisis, and the migrant crisis, and uh, many others. And we very much hope that EU will come stronger out of the uh, current difficult um, situation. And um, uh, out, um, out of those uh, visible internal um, uh, tensions, there will be more Europe and the attractive power of the European Union will continue to speed up, inspire, and motivate uh, our reforms. And I agree that we owe it also to the younger generation of our citizens, of the future leaders. Some of us are with us uh, here today. I also prioritize uh, the youth engagement uh, into the constructive work into the global affairs, as uh, I'm here also in my capacity as the candidate for the UN Secretary General position from the Republic of uh, Moldova. And I'm speaking about youth in my country, in my region. I think. Uh, uh, We've been uh, dealing with the transition for too long, and uh, the next generation would have to benefit from this attractiveness of the European Union to continue and finalize reforms and establish the very same attractive model of the rule of law, human rights, prosperity, and stability which the European Union holds for us. So thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Minister Gehrman. Uh, we have just under an hour uh, left for our conversation here. I'm going to come back, uh, allow uh, Ms. Vice President Timmermans to make a quick comment, Maricha, then I'll pick up uh, uh, Madam Marina Bokova, so please. Thank you very much. If you see what decided the Brexit vote, if you see what's happening in our societies, and I would include American society in that, that is a deep-rooted wish to regain control over our lives and destinies and the feeling that the European Union in Europe has created more insecurity and, indeed, more difference between rich and poor. And so it is logical that people then, with the history of Europe in mind, would say, what created prosperity, what created educational systems, what created healthcare systems, what created... Um, civil society, the state, the nation state. So if the other thing doesn't work in this fourth industrial revolution, let's go back to the thing that we know that worked. And that's the big difference between young people and older people. Young people no longer have that um, reflex, whereas older people do. And there we can find a solution. I think there's a lot of solutions we can find 
in that if we can understand this, but not disregard the fact that everyone wants to regain control over their destinies, and there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing is the solutions that are proposed by the extreme right are only going to lead to disaster because regaining control means excluding the other and going back to a past that, frankly, never was. So that will also never be in the future. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Marita, a quick comment. Well, just quickly picking up on some of the questions and, and comments that were made, I, I would like to urge everybody to um, recognize that some of the concepts that we're sharing here and that we take for granted uh, are actually challenged very uh, strongly uh, in our societies, and so let's be careful that we're not preaching to the converted about principles that the EU is built on and, and the notion of enlargement, which I share, for the record, uh, I very much believe in, but I think we have to recognize that we're increasingly seeing a clash of ideals, uh, perhaps most strongly with the whole refugee uh, situation, where we believe in our international responsibility and adhering to international law, but if it means that nationalist forces are tipped over the critical edge of creating uh, stronger forces within our societies, that's also a movement to recognize. And, and you know, I, I wish we could stick to, uh, to the ideals of, um, uh, of helping people fleeing war uh, endlessly, but it seems like we're reaching limits. So I think it would be helpful for the conversation if, if we would look at the reality uh, on the ground and how to navigate that reality, which uh, is also challenging our ability to find solutions. Um, and secondly, I think the question about where the, where the lines blur between foreign policy and domestic policy, I heard in, in some of the comments as well, um, is very, very important. I mean, on the one hand, we see foreign policy challenges directly coming into our societies. On the other hand, we're so inward focused that it hampers our ability to act as a global player uh, in the European Union. Uh, and I do think, um, building on what uh, Commissioner Timmermans said, that the question of what it means to have control over our own destiny and the choices that inform uh, us today also depends on the perspective that you take. Um, whether you think that significant challenges are coming from outside or are actually in our own borders. And I think that this global perspective is very much lacking in the public debate in Europe today. It is very much as if we are at the heart of every crisis, uh, while if you would recognize the challenges that the EU faces in relative decline, uh, security challenges, environmental challenges, it could also be a key um, foundation to argue for uh, being stronger in a changing world. Terrific. Thank you very much. We'll have a chance to hear in a moment from President Tadic as well as Catherine Yushiko, others like Moldova that are looking into the European Union, aspiring there. I also want to bring into the conversation those that bring a bit of a private sector perspective to this as well in terms of the narrative of prosperity. At the end of the day, growth is a strategic asset in Europe, which will give confidence to that process. But uh, next, let me turn to Irina uh, Bokova, Director General of UNESCO, also a candidate for UN Secretary General from Bulgaria, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Damon. Um, in 1993 um, I was a fellow of NATO on democratic institutions. And um, I was looking at the way um, Europe and the liberal democracies at that time, because we were uh, building um, um, the transition model, a new model. I have here my dear friend, uh, Petr Stoyanov, the former president of Bulgaria, and he knows very well how important this, uh, this process was. And uh, I, I was working on uh, multiculturalism, minorities issues, so looking at the different uh, models. Um, and what I learned, and this was uh, fascinating for the time, that Europe could find uh, a model of multiculturalism uh, with the lesson that um, multiculturalism is a hard work. It is a constant work in order to obtain and to uphold certain values in a democratic society, in a multicultural society, but it can be done. And it was an important lesson also for Bulgaria at that time because we had the transition, peaceful transition into multicultural society, but we could do it. And, uh, and I was thinking further on that um, uh, Europe, which started with the values, a political project, it was not an economic project, then it developed all the, the other. It was rather uh, what, uh, what Paula just said. It was about values. It was about uh, a certain model of, of, of development of society, 
which is based on this, uh, these important values. And then when we look what is happening nowadays, um, and this is where I believe uh, these populists and uh, uh, extreme uh, parties uh, are, are, are flourishing on, on fears, and I totally agree with that. It is uh, rather uh, a, a kind of a manipulation and, and using it uh, and uh, for uh, making these people take refuge in their um, perceived model of identity or their nostalgic, which is not quite true. I totally agree with what was said nowadays. And I come to the question of, um, of uh, the idea, the, the culture and the identities and the cultural project. It is not uh, by surprise that being Director General of UNESCO, we have been working a lot on the ideas about, um, about culture, about identities, about uh, tolerance, about uh, uh, having this successful model based on, of course, uh, some, some values, uh, human rights and the others. And I, I do believe that uh, overall, uh, this cultural project was simply neglected. A lot of more emphasis in Europe and in other circumstances, a lot more emphasis on economic considerations, on others, but the cultural project was neglected. And it is not, uh, we published uh, a couple of years ago an extremely interesting study uh, on diversity and identities, and it is perfectly okay to be an American and Muslim and coming from a certain part of the world, uh, be a European, uh, and, uh, and at the same time having multiple identities. I think this is where uh, not sufficient emphasis has been put in order to work it out on the basis again of these values. So, so I, I, what I want to say that uh, uh, um, Europe is um, outside has a, an enormous projection again of uh, values, of, of guidance of working with this. It's, uh, still attracts, uh, um, I would say, uh, the most when we go to a transformation in any country, in Myanmar, in uh, somewhere in Africa, still Europe is the model that we are looking at, this type of. So this type of defeatism, uh, which is uh, having, uh, I don't believe it's healthy. So we have to show the positive side, what Europe projects uh, as, as values also for the others. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stay in Southeast Europe and turn to uh, President Tadic, please. I'm coming from, from the country which is not member state of European Union, and uh, that is exactly what uh, President Amato has been explaining. We had a promise to become member states on the Saloniki summit. And uh, this period of reasonable time to become member state is uh, disappearing. And I would like to be not, not pessimist, but skeptical, a little bit skeptical. I think this is, that can be healthy. To bring Chapeau Noir is, can be healthy right now. Uh, 2008, uh, General Assembly of United Nations, I had a talks with the leaders of Deutsche Bank. That was a few weeks after Lehman Brothers' case. They told me if uh, European Union is not going to solve problem with the central bank, well, we are going to have a huge problem, unsustainable problem. I'm not sure that European Union even today solved that problem with the role of central bank. Uh, on all international forums, I've been participating. Many people have been mentioning some problems, but never took into the consideration war scenario. Two years ago, we talked about referenda in Great Britain, but no one considered current situation with the Brexit. Many optimistic people are not very healthy in European Union institutions. But now I would like to point out the possible war scenario after Brexit. What about elections in the United States? No one is mentioning elections in the United States. We are in the United States. In the next few weeks, months, we are going to have a possibly new political landscape in the United States. We have two candidates. If Donald Trump is going to win, what about impact of that victory on elections in France? What about European Union in, if in France Marie Le Pen is going to win? What about future of European Union 
if we are going to have that kind of landscape in the structure of European Union. From the beginning of my political life, I was pro-European. We've been dreaming to bring in the former Yugoslavia that kind of society and the values. But as a witness, political witness, of what happened in the former Yugoslavia, I have to remind yourself that war and dismantling of beautiful countries are coming overnight. And this is also possible for European Union. And we have to be very realistic and to take into, the, into the consideration the war scenario. Otherwise, we are going to pay altogether extremely high price. In that respect, my apologies, but I had to bring Chapeau Noir to this round table. Mr. President, thank you. It's, uh, I think it's an important addition to our conversation. Part of why we're here are how high the stakes are, how much we've taken for granted a Europe that is united and as a partner of the United States, and what the stakes are if there is a reversal or if this falls apart. And I think you brought a sober reminder to that conversation. Um, as we continue this conversation, I want to turn, I had seen Ambassador uh, uh, Yossi Gal, uh, if you still would like to join our Israeli ambassador to France, the United States, the Netherlands. I have uh, Representative Hill who can also address uh, that from an American perspective. Uh, but please, Ambassador Gal, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Franz Timmermans uh, started with a story uh, by Shimon Peres, and I was uh, reminded of uh, another quotation of this uh, giant uh, great uh, leader. Shimon Peres once said, uh, you can make an omelette out of eggs, but not eggs out of an omelette. And uh, we gather here, uh, those who believe in uh, the values of the European Union certainly hope that uh, the European Union is an omelette. Now, Europe, uh, Mr. Chairman, faces a long list of challenges, and they were all mentioned here, the State of the Union, immigration, uh, Brexit, and other possible exits, uh, economic stagnations. These are challenges to be tackled and decided by the Europeans. However, uh, there are a few other challenges that are common to all of us uh, sitting here around the table. And uh, they were mentioned in uh, passing. One is, of course, uh, terrorism. Terror nowadays is not uh, confined to the Middle East. Uh, terror is uh, everywhere. And we have seen uh, in recent years a considerable increase in the number of uh, terrorist uh, incidents in uh, Europe, uh, in uh, France, in uh, Belgium, and, and elsewhere. And terrorism is certainly a global uh, a challenge, and as such, it requires a global answer, and it requires Europe and European leaders to engage uh, uh, with the other players uh, here around the table. There's so much uh, to do, uh, like more cooperation, more intelligence sharing, uh, a strict uh, policy on the recruits that uh, find their way back from uh, ISIS to, to Europe. It is quite a challenge to Europe, but it is not confined to Europe. And yes, uh, Europe can work with the moderates in their midst and the moderates in the Arab world because that poses a challenge to them as well. And the second thing that was uh, hardly mentioned here uh, and uh, <coughs> I think that is also relevant, and this is uh, the uh, continuous rise in the number of uh, anti-Semitic uh, incidents uh, around uh, the uh, European continents. This is uh, certainly uh, a challenge for uh, European leaders, so I just wanted to draw attention to this two uh, phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I want to turn to another outside perspective looking into Europe and come to the U.S. political scene with Representative French Hill, Representative from Arkansas, please. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate this morning. I thought the opening comments were worthy and I thank all those who convened it. Uh, to my friends, I have to say I was a young person once, uh, Ambassador, and uh, 
in fact, uh, found myself at an Atlantic Council meeting back in 1986 in uh, Mainz as a young business person in Dallas, Texas. So I've had a long, favorable association with the Atlantic Council. And then uh, when I worked for President Bush, uh, 41 was uh, at the Treasury and coordinated our financial assistance to Central Europe and spent many a happy uh, day in Bulgaria on that mission. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think that uh, we have a lot in common, and the theme is the future of Europe, and I think Europe needs to know that uh, the United States remains you know, fully committed uh, to our partnership, our economic partnership, and our defense partnership. And there are many positive things we can look at and uh, draw attention to. I think that uh, the NATO meeting this summer uh, was encouraging uh, to me on some of the basic tenets of our European security partnership in the face of a lot of challenges. And for that, it's one of our core tenets. And despite uh, concern on both sides of the pond, uh, we have to continue to make uh, progress on the, the trade front. And uh, in my judgment, uh, we will both uh, wander into that abyss and make progress regardless of who uh, is uh, the next president of the United States. But we have to uh, be realistic, I think, in Europe and, and in the United States about some of the things that the Pew Research, I think, noted. Uh, we need to uh, have policies and take policies that inspire youth to aspirational careers and to make sure that uh, all in our economies uh, have a future. And that is one of the things that we share uh, between uh, Europe and the United States. I chair the Skilled Workforce Caucus in the Congress with my friend Brenda Lawrence from Detroit, Michigan. And it's something every governor across our land is focused on, is how we create uh, careers and opportunities that are not purely in the technical uh, sector. And that's a key uh, point to the unrest one finds uh, in our populations. Uh, secondly, I think energy is important, and I think that's another, uh, in my view, success of recent years in our partnership, our economic partnership in Europe vis-a-vis -vis the future of Europe as the uh, exporting of crude oil was approved by the Congress and uh, liquefied natural gas is now freely flowing between North America and Europe. And I think this is an important national security and economic issue uh, that the Europeans have an alternative uh, in their natural gas uh, markets uh, and that can be done in a competitive uh, manner. So I'm, I'm on the uh, cup half full side of the equation today, uh, but uh, we have to, uh, as uh, we've said, lead in one comment from the distinguished gentleman from Italy that caught my attention. And that is uh, in the EU at the uh, European Parliament level of action, uh, you can overdo it. I think you cited garbage collection. Uh, as an example. And we battle that here in the United States, even though we have a federal constitution that quite uh, delineates uh, powers between states and the federal government, and yet it's a source of imminent discussion in this country all the time. And so I would urge my friends in the European Parliament to uh, remember that one size doesn't fit all, at least that's our experience in the United States, and that uh, leaving uh, power close to the people in as many ways as possible are appropriate, and we battle that in this country so frequently. But there are many ways for uh, European Union uh, engagement and improvement, and clearly uh, immigration is, is one. So I'm here to listen. I appreciate the invitation, and it's a delight to be a part of the group this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. I think you put an important issue on the table. Um, part of the strength of EU competency has been in a regulatory phase, and some of that has paved ways for a single market, and some of it has led to the publics to accuse of overreach as the congressman perhaps suggested. So I think that would be interesting to draw out in some of the conversations. I want to turn to Katharina Yushchenko. We've just, we heard from President Tadic who offered a sober warning about how we not take things for granted on the continent. Uh, we heard from Ambassador Gall about the challenges of terrorism that have also mm -hmm. challenged this project. And I'd like to turn to Katarina Yushchenko, uh, uh, recognizing that we actually have conflict in Europe today, in Ukraine today. 
uh, uh, very much uh, challenging Ukraine's aspirations to be a part of what we're talking about, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Damon, for this opportunity to take part in such a thought-provoking and distinguished panel. I do represent a country that's really on the front lines of the fight for European values. Um, people have been laying down their lives, first on a political, um, during a political struggle on our square, where we lost over 100 people fighting for European values and the right to go enter Europe, and then secondly on the battlefield in a military struggle for two and a half years. Uh, because Ukrainians want to be a part of European civilization. They want to see the success of the European project. Despite um, Huntington's um, uh, philosophy thought that we should be a part of the Orthodox world, I think that our young people have said very strongly that they feel that they should be a part of Europe. I teach at a university, um, and I deal with young people every day, and I see their, their desire to see success in Europe and to see Ukraine as successful within Europe. Um, they want to see a Europe that's united. They want to see a Europe that's prosperous, um, democratic, and free. But I have to say that recently we have seen the U.S. step back and we have seen Europe step back from their commitments to, to us to, and to the whole European project. And we've been dismayed when we don't see a single cohesive voice to unite against what we see as an aggressive Russia, the war in the Middle East and the refugee flows, the upsurge in, in the populist parties that we've talked about today, and um, a hearkening back to a past that, as we said, never was, and I agree wholeheartedly with that, um, dealing with the pockets of the economy that have been left behind in globalization and uh, increased Chinese activism. And so I think that what we'd like to see from Ukraine would be um, the following in the future of Europe. First, we'd love to see a strong economy in Europe because we think that that would help our part of the world as well. We would like to see a Europe that's a more forward thinking, um, not fighting globalization, but trying to use fiscal, financial, industrial policy to deal with the effects of globalization. A Europe that might, have, might be a little less bureaucratic, uh, and a Europe that provides a more competitive environment, a legal system to protect um, physical and um, intellectual property rights, support for entrepreneurship, creativity, um, and a preparedness really for the new, re uh, the new industrial revolution that's taking place. Um, secondly, we'd like to see a stronger security structure. We were dismayed also to hear um, recently when the former head of the B British Joint Forces Command, Sir Richard Barron, issued a report saying that the British Armed Forces could not defend the UK in case of a, a conventional attack. And we feel that there has not been enough attention paid to the whole issue of security in Europe and on its borders. Um, we'd like to see a rejuvenated NATO with more participation. We'd like to see new alliances, such as um, talk recently of more of a Baltic to Black Sea alliance for countries that do want to work together to promote security. And of course, we see energy as a very, very important aspect of security. Um, third, and, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about Russia, and I, I feel that it's my role to talk about that. We'd like to see Europe less inward-focused and more um, able to stand up to an increasingly aggressive Russia. Um, we feel that Europe does not always recognize that Russia is not a partner, but it's a regime that has been built on um, considering the U.S. and Europe as mortal enemies. That is how they keep themselves in power. We feel strongly that Russia will keep pushing on us, on other countries, until it is stopped. And no amount of appeasement will stop it. They, they, that we need to negotiate from a um, position of strength that, rather than just diplomacy. Um, Europe needs to avoid the attempts by Russia to divide and conquer it, to ruin the unity within the, U the EU and between the EU and the United States. And I think that recently you have seen um, in Europe the aspects of a hybrid war that we have had to face for almost two decades. And when we talked about it before, many people thought that we were um, maybe even a little bit paranoid. But um, it, I think you're now seeing it coming to your, own, um, to your own countries and working internally in your country. First, the use of energy as a weapon. We have faced that, and I think we have seen that in Europe. 
second in information war where hundreds of million dollars are being spent to, um, to promote hatred, to promote dissent, to promote um, intolerance. Um, filling Western minds with um, paranoid ideas. We've seen um, the Russians giving huge loans in the tens of millions of dollars to people like Marie Le Pen and to other, um, uh, to other political parties. This is something we have seen for many, many years, parties that have been supported by Russia to work in our country against us, and we hate to see that happening in Europe as well. We've seen... Um, them buying elites, giving bribes, giving business deals. Um, we've seen el el uh, politicians in Europe suddenly switching positions after meetings with the Russians. Um, we see a refugee crisis that we think to a large extent is being exacerbated by Russian participation in Syria and by um, other things that they have been doing. Um, we see some aggression on the borders of Europe that Europe has been reluctant to respond to. And I think an important aspect that, has not, that we have not talked about is, is a new battleground, and that's cyber warfare. And I think this is an increasingly dangerous um, um, battleground that we really, 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 really need to address, and we have faced it. When, um, they, when Russia can interfere in elections, we can give you examples where they did in ours, in our vote counts and other things, and now we see that that could happen in the United States. We greatly fear in Ukraine that you will see something in the third or fourth week of um, October coming from Julian Assange or from Russia or from new, newly released um, uh, documents that could affect the election. We also fear that there will be, um, if the election goes one way or the other, that there could be discontent in the United States, because we have faced that. But um, I'd like to conclude on a more positive note. I, I would like to um, second Paula's and others' um, thoughts about the importance of including young people. I would like to see more young people from my country here and others. And I say that as someone who was an intern in 1980, 36 years ago, with the Atlantic Council, uh, when I was at Georgetown University talking about the importance of an Atlantic partnership. And so it's, it's I think, very positive to see that the same um, important issues are being raised again and again, even though in a, in a little bit more of a challenging environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just delighted to unearth we've our first lady or congressman with your uh, Atlantic Council pass. Um, that's uh, what this whole effort is about, uh, so thank you. We've just had the former First Lady remind us of the connection between values, European values, and the challenge in hard security terms as it's played out in Ukraine. I want to turn to Vasilis Leventis, uh, the head of the leader of the Union of Centrists and a member of the Hellenic Parliament, because the future of Europe has also been, uh, uh, Athens has been ground zero for much of questioning and debates about the future of Europe. We have just 30 minutes left. I want to make an effort to bring all of you into the conversation still remaining, so I ask everyone to keep their comments tight. Please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity you give me. I salute the total of the summit. It's a great honor uh, for me to address such a high-level audience. I am the president of the Union of Centrists, a political party which entered the Hellenic part Parliament one year ago. After 35 years of struggle and efforts, the reason that took so long the Union of Centuries to enter the Hellenic Parliament can be found in the political system which arose in Greece after the junta of the colonels of the period 1967-1974. This political system developed clientelistic relations with the citizens, nourished a gigantic and ineffective public sector, led to corruption, a, sig a significant percentage of Greeks muzzled and destroyed politically the opposing views represented by the Union of Centrists. 
Nevertheless, we remain, we remained upright for 35 years. We did not shrink bank, back. We did not compromise. And we finally won. Now slandered and attack, attacked by all the other political parties in Greece, we continue our successful course by rapidly increasing our forces. I hope in the future I will have the opportunity in bilateral meetings with you to explain in detail what happened in Greece after 1974 and how we ended up bankrupt and under memoranda agreements. Please allow me to take stock of the following issues. First, concerning the refugee crisis, the world powers and the European Union have the, to converge politically on the future of countries afflicted by war or the scourge of terrorism. The terrorists are exploiting the differences and the rivalry between the world powers, and this gives rise to waves of refugees. Second, the refugee flows should be checked by well-equipped units under European control and by agencies with the appropriate experience. All countries have the duty to give provisional shelter to the refugees in accordance with their size. We must also confront with arguments the xenophobic and racist propaganda. Third, Turkey should honor and abide by its agreements and not blackmail pressure through threats. We in Greece are looking forward to having good relations with Turkey. Turkey, however, has to prove that respects the rules and the decisions of the European Union. Lastly, the Union of Centrists supports the reforms in Greece at all levels. We do not ask for money. We ask, we ask for development opportunities. We pledge, we pledge to introduce broad incentives to attract foreign investment. We will complete all the reforms required by European Union and IMF, but we nourish the self-evident expectation that our partners in Europe will do their duty concerning our external debt relief and sustainability. We are not asking from you to solve the drama of the impoverished Greeks with money from your own taxpayers. There is a lot of wastefulness and pathogenies in our country, which, if corrected, could result in supporting our citizens who live in the limit of poverty and in curbing the exodus of our young people who seek work abroad. I thank you sincerely for your philhellenic feelings and for what you have done for my country up to now, and I am looking forward to meeting you in the future. Mr. Leader, thank you very much for that, that intervention. I want to continue with our time. We're going to try to end sharp in the next 23 minutes, so I want to try to bring up folks in on the strategic issues. I'm going to come back now. I've got Guy de Sellier, a passionate Europeanist uh, who spreads his time between uh, London and Brussels. Please, Guy, and then to Mark Leonard. Yes, you suggested I comment on the Brexit situation. I completely agree with Prime Minister Amato that the game is not over yet, and that uh, if you think about it from a democratic standpoint, uh, I find it difficult to believe that if in three years from now, once the reality of Brexit has sunk in and, and what the deal is, that uh, the people of Great Britain would not be allowed to have to express their views uh, and that the, the views expressed in 2016 uh, would, uh, <coughs> would, would have to prevail and that no public consultation would be, would, uh, would be allowed. But 
how it's going to happen, it's most uncertain. The question I have, though, is that if the British change their view and decide that they want to have a referendum, how would they be welcomed by the Europeans? <laughs> because I think if we spend two years negotiating a Brexit arrangement, and I can hear that number of, of, of people in Europe were saying, well, you know, the goal was probably right after all, and when he said that, be careful about in <laughs> introducing the British, uh, uh, would, uh, would they be taken back with open arms or with some reluctance? It's a question. I'm sure there are people here who could have some views on that. Now, when we look at how the campaign was uh, developed, there was a big mistake made by, I think, uh, a lot of the Remain campaign and 10 Downing Street to start with, is to focus purely on the economic argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a single issue campaign that they ran. And in the end, the economic argument was probably won pretty comprehensively, with even the public mind, but it was, of course, lost. The referendum was lost on the question of immigration and on the question of sovereignty. On the question of sovereignty, it's, it's a mystery to me how, how we didn't manage to actually explain to the people that it's a, there, there's a transfer of sovereignty, but on all the important issues, which is education, health care, uh, income tax, uh, welfare, uh, pension arrangements, housing policy, uh, on all of these issues, there's very little interference, if any, at all from, from the European, uh, I mean, from, from Brussels. And, and those are the issues which really matter to people. And there is no... People haven't understood that. And I think the, the message here is that we need to do a better job of explaining actually what, uh, what uh, sovereignty rights have been transferred and what have not. And the big, the big uh, point which was absent from the debate was values. We all talked about values here and European values. But if you try to raise that if, with the people in a public forum, I mean, nobody really pays attention. Nobody really believes in it. And when we try to raise a question in the campaign about uh, the impact, uh, that, I mean, what Europe has achieved in terms of maintaining peace, people would dismiss that. They say, oh, no, 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 that's NATO. Nothing to do with Europe. It's NATO. And try to explain that actually it's the values that the European, you know, promotes which have prevented or which have created that stability. Very, very difficult argument. So if we are going to have another referendum, we're going to have to find better ways of conveying some of these messages. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, controversial idea of going back to the British public on this and that impact on Europe. Let me turn to Mark Leonard, the head of ECFR, and then I'll come to uh, Ministers Legumcha and, and Yermich. Um, I want to start by echoing what other people have said about how um, wonderful this discussion is, So, uh, because it does bring together, I think, in a really important way, the internal politics which are coursing through different member states of the European Union at the moment and what's really at stake for the future of Europe in terms of the order of our continent and some of the big gains in terms of building a, a liberal international order over the last few uh, decades. I uh, was watching with uh, increasing horror the, the referendum in the UK from an insider-outsider perspective. My mother is uh, <clears throat> German Jew who was born in exile in, in France at the end of the Second World War in hiding, and my father is, uh, is British, and his life and, and career have been very much determined by the European Union. He was one of the uh, 69 Labour parliamentarians who rebelled against their party to vote to get into the European Union in 1973. Um, so for me, this was the biggest political defeat of my lifetime. I'm still trying to come to terms with what it means. Um, like uh, many people, um, I, I think David Cameron deserves a lot of the blame for, for, for what happened and for calling the referendum. But I think it is important as this discussion has done to recognize that what happened in the UK is not just a weird piece of British exceptionalism. The trifecta of economic uncertainty, cultural anxiety, and political alienation, which came to a head in the, the, the vexed issue of, of migration and the, the kind of negative effects of free movement, are 
uh, forces which are completely redefining all of our politics across the developed world as much in this country as in all the European countries where the consensus for European action and the idea that Europe is the first line of defense against the rest of the world is, is being uh, contested. And I think it is really important that we understand that we are going through a counter-revolution where many of the big steps forward over the last few decades have become a focus for political opposition in, in all of our different countries. And that um, it is that project of the European Union which, which has become the, the mobilizing fact for new political forces in, in lots of different places. We did some research looking at the 55 insurgent parties which have been set up in all the different member states of the European Union, and we found that there are another 34 referenda being called for in 18 different member states, not all in-out referenda, but on subjects related to the European Union. Um, and everywhere there is an attempt to recast politics as a battle between established cosmopolitan elites and um, the left-behind citizens who uh, feel that their lives are being con uh, transformed and who, as, as Vice President Timmerman said, want to, to regain control over what they're doing. So I, I think the lesson we need to take from this is that uh, rather than focusing too specifically on the narrow negotiations between London and the EU 27 about what future arrangements take place, and I very much hope that President Amato is, is right about <laughs> what happens within the UK. But I think that we need to, to rethink a bigger question about what is the European project in this sort of age, because there was almost Marxist, it's ironic given that the EU was one of the big bulwarks against communism, but there was an almost kind of Marxist idea that if you create uh, an economic base which links the European Union together, and uh, that you'll get a political superstructure <laughs> which appears on top of that, where people kind of uh, want to be bound together and where interdependence becomes a, a barrier to conflict. Whereas in fact, the, the tragedy of domestic politics in, in all the EU member states now is that it is interdependence which is driving this counter-revolution. People are worried about the, the euro and the prospects for financial contagion, and that's as true in debtor as in creditor countries. People are worried about refugees. They're worried about the, the dislocation uh, to social conditions and to public services that comes from free movement, and they're worried about terrorism. And unless we can show people that the European Union, which has been so fabulous at ripping down the walls and the barriers between people, getting rid of, of boundaries, of regulations, of uh, the things which stand between people can also protect them from the dark side of interdependence, then I think we're going to have a, a major crisis. And I think that has to be the project for the next period, is making interdependence feel safe for ordinary citizens again. And that does mean a sort of rethinking of the purpose of the EU. But also, it does mean that a lot of the questions that we've been worrying about in, in recent times are going to have to be rethought. I, I, think that the enlargement of the European Union is one of the, the great advances in civilization um, of, of many years to see the EU underpinning the domestic peaceful transformation of so many different countries. But at the same time, it's pretty clear to me that the EU that's going to exist in 5, 10, 15 years will be much very different from the EU that we've uh, that we, uh, not because I want it to be, but just it's an inevitable fact. It's going to be a different kind of EU. And enlargement's not going to be simply new countries joining the existing EU. We're going to have to rethink what kind of institutions we have for the continent. The relations with Britain will be part of that. But I think it, it does require a lot more creativity and a much uh, richer idea of, of what the future of Europe is. That also applies to other areas. I think we need to, 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 to think again about how you protect the internal, uh, the external borders, how you deal with uh, bailing out the, the losers of interdependence <coughs> from free movement from other areas. A lot of these things need to be done at a national level, but the EU needs to create a, a, an, em, an empowering framework rather than giving people a sense that they're taking uh, control away from them. And Perfect. I think the whole debate about TTIP um, is going to have to be rethought in, in that context as well. 
Terrific. Thank you very much, Mark. I want to, when we come to close uh, with Vice President Timmermans and Marecha, maybe you can react a little bit to that, how you define the European project at this time, its relevance to our populations, yet not equating democracy with a continuous string of referenda and the challenge that, that potentially presents. Uh, I still want to come as we think about um, uncertainty in the core of Europe, how that reverberates in uh, the periphery of Europe and come to uh, Minister Legumcha of Bosnia first and then I'll come to you, Minister Jaramic, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad that I'm speaking after a colleague uh, who mentioned the enlargement uh, because uh, I just want I'm thinking to Madame Ischenko that was talking a little bit about Ukraine because that gave me a hope that we are talking about the future of Europe, not only about the future of European Union. Uh, in that sense, uh, I would like to point out three things. First thing, I think that we have to strongly re-engineer, uh, reiterate the sense of urgency for necessity of changes, of comprehensive changes in which enlargement is itself not only physical thing, but logical thing as well. Um, as uh, Ambassador Dabransky was talking about the need for new moral narrative and the need for new political and moral narrative, that's something that we have to uh, reinvent the sense of urgency for necessity of such a things. So that's one point. Second point, I really want to thank to uh, Mr. Uh, Vike, who gave us excellent presentation, and uh, I'll just uh, catch up on the uh, on first uh, slide. Uh, I saw similar uh, research just a few months ago that is talking not only about the financial future, but about the future general of the same area, and results are almost the same. So basically speaking, when we talk about future, people see the future in sense of financial future almost the same. Uh, what gives me the reason to to point out in here is uh, all of us are, regardless of our background, we all did make sometimes something because we believed in it, because of our attitude, not because of our ability. Whatever we did, is it politics or whatever else? But ability is something which is necessary, but without attitude you cannot do anything. So my point is that I think we have to use this, uh, this first slide as a warning that if attitude is something that will drive people in a positive future, then European and United States have reason to be very worried because the overall attitude is very, very uh, frightening. Uh, in that sense, probably the future belongs to Africa and Asia and Pacific because their attitude is significantly better, not only because of uh, big GDP growth, but because of the right of the reasons and because of the variety of the things. And the third point is um, I think that uh, we have to, and some people talk about values. Sometimes we are even joking with values. Sometimes we are too much cynical about the values. Uh, and I have to uh, point out how important it is that our values don't become empty words, empty thoughts. Uh, because one of the reasons why we are where we are is because suddenly, I mean, as, as you rightly said, people have no idea what our values are, what the values of Europe is. Whose fault is that? Is that the fault of the people? Or is it the fault of the people who promote and live and make their future and their careers on those values? So in that sense, I think that it is very important to point out that uh, we have perfect example, and I'll finish with those example of refugees, of course. Uh, you know, to be more alive. Uh, we see the German and Swedish chancellors and prime ministers cooperating on one side, one coming from People's Party, one coming from Social Democratic grouping. At the same time, we see Slovak and Hungarian prime minister who are coming also from two different political camps. So that example uh, is clear signal that today it's not no more about right or left in Europe or European Union. It's about right and wrong in policies in European countries. It's about inclusiveness versus exclusiveness. It's about shared versus segregated societies. It's about uh, equitability versus inequality. And after all, it's about cooperating over values and hopes versus confronting over interests and fears which people are misusing in order to get political gains. Uh, 
I'm just waiting when someone will come out of the wrong side of Europe, promoting that we have solution for refugees uh, in a sense that we make a wall for refugees and the refugees will pay for it. If not refugees, then Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, they will pay for it. That would be the last point before we close the circle in which actually we go back again to square one. We need a new, um, as you said, not only moral, but also political narrative. Uh, I think that I'm sitting here and I'm looking across at President Barroso and Prime Minister Mato. I think that uh, Prime Minister Mato was sharing one of the very distinguished International Commission for Balkan, which 10 years ago actually pointed out where we're going to. And Prime Minister Barroso was uh, actually uh, leading European Union in the most glorious time of enlargement. So I think that uh, European Union and Europe is going to have much more problems with, if we stop with this process of enlargement because as I heard one Orthodox uh, Archbishop of Syria in one similar event saying that I'm not afraid for Christians in Syria, I'm afraid for Syria without Christians. Something a very brief paraphrase for Europe. I'm not afraid for the future of Europe. I'm afraid for, for Europe and West Balkan. I'm afraid for Europe without West Balkan and Balkan as part of the- Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Minister. I do want to try to keep us tight, so please, uh, the final comments. Uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Jeremic, uh, please, from Serbia. Thank you very much, uh, Damon. I understand this is coming at a very uh, late stage, so I'm not gonna be talking for far too long. Uh, it's a, it's a great privilege to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I did uh, uh, spend a part of my uh, life and career working for a government under the leadership of President Tadic that uh, worked very hard for the Western Balkans uh, to join Europe, worked closely with Minister Lagumja at the time on issues related to reconciliation in the, in the Western Balkans. But uh, what I'm gonna try now is to take a, for a second a bird eye view I'm not going to talk about the um, internal uh, crisis of the European Union. I'm not going to talk about what led us to here, what the European project is about. It's a very uh, complex, obviously, topic. I'm just going to um, take a security and defense view for a second. And, um, and Madam Yushchenko, she, she spoke about threats emanating out of the East. I'm going to talk about the Middle East because what is going on in the Middle East is, uh, is, is a crisis that is deeply affecting the whole world, and Europe in particular. And, uh, and the last year's uh, refugee crisis was, uh, was a very clear show of, uh, of how deeply and how profoundly Europe is affected by what's going on there. What I find uh, absolutely unacceptable is, uh, is the lack of uh, the role for the European Union uh, at the table when the Middle East, Syria, Libya, other parts of the Middle East is being discussed, let alone Europe showing leadership uh, and uh, diplomatic or, or military leadership for that matter in resolving an issue that has such a direct impact on the future of the Union. Uh, I believe that there was a significant loss to the future of um, um, common foreign and defense policy of the European Union with a with a Brexit, I'm afraid that Brexit does mean Brexit and that it's not gonna uh, go back. Uh, it's a loss, but not necessarily a tragedy. Uh, I think we should try and look for ways to recuperate and refocus and perhaps uh, um, go stronger uh, as a result of what had taken place, but. Uh, one of the critical issues where we need to look at as Europeans is how to forge the common foreign and defense policy that is going to make us relevant again and uh, at the global at a global level. I think it's unacceptable that Turkey plays a much more significant role in the Middle East than than the whole of Europe together. This is the direction where we need to be looking at. Thank you very much, Minister. Important element of our conversation. If I could do a quick closing uh, wrap up with our final comments, let me turn to Ambassador Mavrionis of uh, Cyprus, please. 
Thank you, Damon. At this late stage, I would like just to make uh, two very brief uh, comments. Two reminders, as a matter of fact. The first one is that uh, from my current experience in Cyprus and the prospects for a unification of Cyprus, we understand even better the importance of being in the European Union and the catalytic effect of being in the Union in order to address political problems. And this brings us to the basics of European unification, which is Europe as a political project. We have seen this in Northern Ireland. We are seeing this in Cyprus. We have seen this in many other uh, occasions. The second, very briefly, is uh, drawing on what uh, Franz Timmermans said about you know, regaining control. Regaining control is unfortunately a concept that we, which was led astray in a way because people are thinking that regaining control is going one's own way, working isolation, whilst regaining control from ancient Greek times was working together. You were participating in something. If you were not participating, you were not. You are not doing anything. So we need to go back again to this basic and understand that the European project started like that during the first world war Jean Monnet has proposed already you know pooling supplies second world war we had even an idea of unification of France and the United Kingdom and then we went on and on so regaining control is not isolation thank you thank you very much and come to your colleague uh, Spiridon Flagiatis director of the European Public Law Organization please Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to add a few words because we are talking a lot about uh, uh, populism and uh, nationalism returning to Europe and to, to, and to our nations. I believe that we should not forget that uh, the European Union of today is not anymore the European, uh, the, the, the European uh, Union, what, whatever it was called in those days, of the six or of the ten. We have many new countries. Some of them uh, came to uh, independence very recently. Their societies uh, understand what freedom is only in the last few decades. And the Europe of the six or the Europe of the 10 has 30 or 40 more years of experience of being together and sharing values and working together. So we need to pay attention and to hear and to listen to what the new societies which came, which came into the European Union are trying to tell us. Perhaps they are right, perhaps they are wrong, but we need to pay attention to them. And we need to pay attention to the societies which are in a row to come into the European Union and to try to integrate them. Unless we do that, we are getting into trouble. Thank you. And very uh, I hope we will. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, reminder, sober reminder. And I had, Ron, please, uh, we'd like to hear from, as a uh, closing, our chairman of the uh, Banco Popular Español. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this very interesting discussion. It's only to give the, the point of view of a scapegoat in the crisis, bankers and banks. Uh, first, to say that they represent a, a retail bank that is really involved in, in population needs, in the, in the lives of people. Uh, retail banks provide financing and serve the, the financial needs of millions of people in Europe and in the world, and especially as SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses, self-employees, families. So it's activity that, that is really involved in, 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 in people's lives. So first to say is that uh, no matter if these banks were not involved in the origin of the financial crisis, bankers acknowledge that uh, banks need to restore reputation and to restore image. And the only way to do that is by providing sustainable financing to businesses and to and families in a sustainable way. And 
the point of view of a survivor, we are survivors of the crisis, uh, is that regulation could finally kill survivors by creating too big to fail entities. So in order to avoid that, what is very important is to, to strike a deal, to strike a balance between huge capital requirements to make banking safer and to attract the interest of long-term long -term investors. That is key for, not only for banks, it's key for a sustainable economic growth in Europe and at the end of the day to get uh, more social stability in Europe. Banks at the end of the day will be responsible or will, be, or will play a crucial uh, role in uh, the success of economic growth in Europe as a whole. So to attract the interest of the investors, banks need to be profitable. It sounds obvious, but it's not obvious. The social situation now in Europe is just the opposite. So uh, it's unpopular, but we need profitable banks. And now profit, profitability in bank, for banks in Europe is now uh, being challenged by the political instability in Europe. We will have elections, as you have said, uh, in France, in Germany, we will have a referendum uh, next October in Italy, and we'll have elections in the States that are affecting the activity of banks in all over Europe and in the world. Second, we have a very weak economic growth in Europe. Third, this loose monetary, uh, monetary policy with zero interest rate won't stay for longer because it is damaging the long-term profitability of banks, and four, uh, we are now uh, in an environment of overregulation, so we have to de uh, deploy a lot of efforts to, to comply with. And to finish, what banks ask? First, in Europe, to complete banking union. We don't have a federal deposit insurance company like in the States, and we need. We have a single supervisory mechanism, we have a resolution mechanism, but we don't have uh, a, a, a deposit scheme, a, a single deposit scheme. We need a level playing field. We need more Europe. We need more Europe, a single treasury, a single fiscal authority. And third, and finally, we need a banking regulation that clearly favors the SMEs, the small and medium-sized business financing that are responsible for the bulk of creating jobs in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've run just a couple minutes over because I wanted to play out this conversation. I want to give the unenviable task of coming back to Vice President Timmermans, um, who has the leadership role right now, to talk and help close on, on the idea of the European project at this time, as well as my co-conspirators. Please, Vice President Timmermans. Thank you very much for all these incredibly uh, important comments. Um, you know, like in the three previous industrial revolutions, in this industrial revolution, we either adapt or we disappear. And I think, I think what we need is the audacity to be realistic and truthful about that. Uh, and I think that takes huge amount of audacity, idealism, and perseverance. And that's what we politicians should be doing. Peddling a past that never was and thus proposing a future that will never be, it's, it's you know, like peddling drugs or alcohol. It gives you a nice feeling for a couple of days and the headache becomes ever bigger. And that's the situation we're in in Europe. We've gone from a situation where, you know, I, my parents can tell you stories about the war. My children can no longer. They need to watch a band of brothers to know what the war was all about. But so we've gone from a situation where we knew why it is good to take away borders because borders meant, taking away borders meant creating a common destiny and interdependence to a situation where today interdependence in this huge upheaval that the fourth industrial revolution is creating is causing insecurity instead of security. So as long as Europe is perceived and the European Union as a source for insecurity and injustice, may I add, Europe will be in trouble. As if we can't take that away, you know, 
we can talk uh, until kingdom come, but people will turn their backs to the European project. Does that mean that we need to keep things as they are also in terms of institutions? No. Things might have to change. And the, that will be in the hands of the people of Europe and their representatives elected at a national level. The only thing we are are the instruments of uh, uh, citizens and nation states. Nothing more, nothing less. If they want to define new instruments, that's their full sovereign right. If they want to use us, please do. We'll do our best. But the core issue we need to address is how are we going to shape our future in a world where distances disappear and where change is coming at a more rapid pace than ever before. That is the core question we need to answer. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Marita, uh, please, how do you bring this together in a coherent way as we think about taking forward this effort? Good question, but uh, I think the comments were, were very valuable, so I'm going to summarize some of the core thoughts that I heard, and I know this is not the end of a conversation, but a start of one that we'll have more often, so um, uh, I think it's necessary because if one thing uh, was clear is that the stakes are high and uh, the challenges are serious. Um, one of the takeaways is that we should be aware and prepared for the worst case scenario, that there are many new threats from uh, energy to cyber, from Russia to Syria, and that we should not be complacent. Uh, we should go back to the root principles and seek more of a moral narrative. Be clear and, and self-confident self about what we stand for. Uh, and perhaps also uh, present clear choices to the member states of the European Union what they want and make sure that they're also uh, prepared to uh, engage their citizens on uh, what the direction is and why, what the compromise is and why, and why it is they make decisions in the common interest uh, and how that serves the national interest instead of uh, competes with it. Um, we need, I think, an update and an innovation of the European Union without compromising or stepping away from the uh, root principles, while including young people. I think that was a very clear message today. Uh, what we do now and in the long term clearly will impact the next generation, and they should be a part of informing uh, the process. Um, the notion of interdependence came up a lot uh, as a result of uh, uh, revolutionary changes, rapid changes, globalization, and technology. Uh, but we should also be honest about uh, the negative sides of this interdependence, uh, and I think that that was a clear message as well. Uh, I was inspired by the notion that uh, worldwide um, and in our neighborhood, particularly, the EU still inspires, uh, and I hope that that will domestically inform decisions, uh, our role in the world not only uh, our role at home. Uh, I hope that flexibility of a future Europe will not mean more fragmentation and a race to the bottom. I think we have to be cautious for that while allowing for uh, different, different modes. Um, and uh, I guess in ending, I hope uh, that as we continue this conversation, we are also aware of, of who we are and that this is a bit of a bubble. Uh, and I hope that all of you, and I also say this to myself, will avoid preaching to the converted, will reach across borders, will reach uh, across uh, generations and across uh, those who may have uh, different political ideas than us. I think it is really important to understand and not to discard people with different opinions, voters in my case, uh, because of course we, we have to win them over with uh, ideas and results uh, if indeed we want to strengthen the core. Terrific. Thank you very much. I want to remind as we wrap that this is a the strategic dialogue is not just a one-off dialogue here. What you've done today is enter into part of, of what we're undertaking recognizing that we're in the midst of some type of historic transition right now. We have taken for granted some of the incredible historic successes that Europe and the transatlantic relationship have enjoyed. And we've gone from a narrative of the European project being the path for peace and prosperity to those being able to argue now it's insecurity and injustice, as the Vice President said, subject to manipulation, sometimes from the Kremlin, sometimes from populists, sometimes a combination of both. What's clear, I think, to all of us is that a linear way forward is likely to fail. This isn't a self-executing process. There needs to be change. What is the European project at this time, and what is the United States' role in supporting that? And I think the question we're putting before us is, do we help galvanize a group to help shape that future, or do we sit back and leave a void? And if we leave a void, is that filled by those that are our adversaries or those that don't share our values and interests, or is that void filled simply by chaos? Witness more Syrias, witness more Ukraines. I think we need to be figuring out how we mobilize to understand that, yes, we have to adapt a rules-based world order to a, a, a new future, 
but we also have to be committed to defending it and defending the values that underpin it. And if we don't begin by getting America's role in the world right, in partnership with a Europe that can be a, Europe, a united Europe of, of partner of first resort, everything else on that global agenda, everything else that will be discussed during the UN General Assembly week becomes so much more difficult if the United States and Europe aren't able to stand together on these tough issues. And so we're facing the prospect of potential retrenchment, the return of isolationism in our countries, of these internal challenges, or simply just the internal politics and bickering being an opportunity cost that takes some of our European partners off that global agenda. And so all of you in your own way, whether in politics, uh, in your own countries, across Europe, in business, uh, have been leaders in shaping the transatlantic relationship and shaping the Europe that we have today. And I think we want by your showing up and participating in this conversation to reach out to help mobilize you, but also to expand this in terms of this intergenerational strategy on how we actually shape this future in the right direction. So thank you for giving us your time for this dialogue today. We do see this as the start of a process. And thank you for the service that you've already provided uh, to this, these ideals, these values, but we hope to come knocking on your door and calling on you further. So Mr. Vice President, thank you for being with us and thanks to all of our colleagues for your time. Those of you who have joined and joined the conversation online, we appreciate that as well. If you're interested in being engaged in this effort, uh, feel free to follow up with Megan Poole, myself, Damon Wilson, Mauricio Shakte, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to include you as this process moves forward with Concordia. Thank you.